The text for the sermon this day is taken from that reading from Acts, which you heard earlier. And I'm going to very much incorporate the hymn, Up Through Endless Ranks of Angels, which we're going to be singing after this sermon in the midst of the prayer of the church. So, grace, peace, and mercy to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. First, because I forgot to mention at the beginning, there is a reason we extinguish the candle on Ascension Day. It's to symbolize the anticipation of Christmas, because that's the next time it will get lit. And secondly, it's to symbolize the anticipation of Christ's return. So, because ever since he ascended, we've been waiting his, his return. So, just a little side note. So, every single Sunday of the church year has what is known as the hymn of the day. It is a hymn that is selected based upon the main theme of the day, usually the gospel lesson. And that is usually sung right in between the gospel lesson and the sermon. Not always, but usually. And they're not always sung because some of them are difficult to sing. But <laughs> for Ascension Day, there's actually two traditional hymns of the day. The old one is on Christ's Ascension, I Now Build. We sang that last night for the Saturday night service. And the more recent one is this hymn, Up Through Endless Ranks of Angels. It was written in 1973 by Henry Garricky, who is actually a professor at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, so it's kind of new, so the writer is still alive. But the hymn is such a wonderful hymn to express what ascension is. And from the get-go, it gets you to start to imagine what it was like in heaven when Jesus returned. Because think about this. Go all the, way, all the way back in Genesis. The promise was given to Adam and Eve. That the offspring, of the offspring of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Now they had many ideas as to who that offspring would be. Very likely they thought it was going to be Cain. And we know that didn't work out. And it wasn't Abel either. And so not the way they had planned. And you go through all of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament is paving the way to the crushing of the serpent, to that offspring. So that's why when you read about the flood, the reason why you know that somebody's going to come out alive is because the promised offspring had not been born yet. The reason why you know when Abraham sacrifices Isaac was asked to sacrifice Isaac, somehow or another, Abraham's going to end up with the son, is because of God's promise of that offspring that is going to come through Abraham. All throughout the Old Testament, it's all about paving the way to this offspring. And by the way, before any of you think that um, Jesus was God's plan B, you probably have heard that before, it was not plan B, it was the only plan. In Ephesians, it says that before the foundations of the world, God chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. So in other words, before the foundations of the world, God already had a plan in place. So the plan, so the promise is all through the Old Testament until you get to that little town in Bethlehem on Christmas morning, you hear about it, or Christmas Eve, that 13 to 15 year old girl Mary gives birth to a child who is named Jesus, and he would grow up and he would preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. He would preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins. He would do incredible signs and wonders, and then he would be arrested. He would be crucified. He would die. He would be buried. And on the third, after three days and three nights, dead, he would rise from the dead. If you're ever wondering how those three nights work, remember in Jewish calendar, nights are determined by whether or not the sun is up. And so on Fr Good Friday, there was an unexpected night in the middle of the day when it was dark during the crucifixion. 
So that's one of the three nights. That helps you out a bunch. So three days, three nights, he's dead. On Sunday, he is, on that Easter Sunday, he rises from the dead just as he had, planned, he had promised, he said what happened. And then for 40 days, he went about showing himself physically, bodily, risen from the dead to almost 500 people. And now on the mountain, after everything that God had set forth, he accomplished it, Jesus had accomplished it, and he ascends into heaven. So you imagine what the music must have been like from those angels as their king was coming home in victory. Could you imagine those songs? As it says, up through endless ranks of angels, cries of triumph in his ears. He actually put that up on the screen, verse 1. To his heavenly throne ascending, having vanquished all their fears, Christ looks down upon his faithful, leaving them in happy tears. So endless ranks of angels singing music that no mortal ear has ever heard. I mean, think back. You've, some of you, you know, you've seen it in photos or maybe you were alive at the time. But think about when the soldiers came back from World War II. Do you remember the celebrations you see in photos? and the, the parades and, that was happening, do you realize how much bigger the celebration is when Jesus returns to his kingdom, having accomplished everything he had set forth to do? And so this hymn is imagining that arrival. But the disciples, they are left behind. And they are doing what you probably would do. When somebody goes up into the sky, and by the way, there's, this is on the top of a mountain or a hill, so don't worry, there's not like a pulley system. He's getting pulled up, and they probably didn't have that anyways. So he's going up in an unusual, very not normal thing to happen. So he's going up into the sky, and what would you be doing? You'd be like, is he coming back? What's going on? You know, that's what they're, they're staring up into the sky, exactly what you probably would be doing. And so while they're staring into the sky, the angels speak to them and say, Men of Galilee, why are you staring into the sky? This Jesus will return just as he left. And so the disciples are wondering. So actually, they don't even have to wonder. What should they do? Jesus actually told them exactly what to do. To stay there in Jerusalem. To wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And when they receive the Holy Spirit, they know what they are supposed to do. Because Jesus had spent many days telling them this. And you can read it at the end of all of the Gospels. They are told, go baptize and make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching. He told them to go spread the go preach the Gospel to all of creation. He told them to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. He told them to feed his lambs, that is, to baptize. He told them to feed his, to tend to his sheep, that is, to teach his sheep. And third, to feed his sheep, give the Lord's Supper. They are given the task to be witnesses, to teach, to baptize, to give the sacraments. In other words, they were given the duties, the task of every single church and every single place and every single time. They were given that task, and that, by the way, is still the task of the church. Baptize, teach, minister the sacrament. That is what the church is to do. And they began with those disciples. And by the way, you go on to Pentecost, you see them doing that as soon as the Holy Spirit comes. And note it says to start in Jerusalem. So they are in Jerusalem. And the very first thing they start doing is they start speaking to other people in other tongues. They're speaking in tongues. Which, by the way, what this means is they're speaking in other languages. And it's kind of freaky for everyone. 
because just imagine you see me speaking English and you are hearing, so my mouth, are, my mouth is matching English, but you're hearing German. Kind of give you an idea as to what they were witnessing. This is why everybody thought the disciples were drunk. Because their mouth was not matching the things that they were hearing. They were hearing their own language, even though the disciples were speaking their language. Which is kind of a preview of what God has in store for the last day. But that's right away what they are doing. They are being witnesses of what Jesus has done in Jerusalem. And then Peter stands and he gives this sermon, bearing witness. And the entire books of Acts is them starting in Jerusalem, going to Judea, the surrounding area, then Samaria, and going to the ends of the earth because Acts ends in Rome. They are doing exactly as Jesus had commanded them to do. And that's exactly what we as Christians are called to do. So verse 2, death destroying, life restoring, proven equal to our need. Now for us before the Father, as our brother intercede, flesh that for our world was wounded, living for the wounded plead. See, when you came to faith, whether that's through baptism, somebody speaking the gospel to you, whatever means that was, God did not take you up to heaven that second. He kept you here for a reason. To be his witnesses. To be his missionaries. To spread the gospel. Wherever your, wherever your vocation is, whatever your calling is, God has placed you there, whether it is in your job, whether it's at school, whether it's in your hobbies, whatever it may be, God has placed you there to be witnesses of his gospel. You are his servants wherever he has you. And the thing is, is the reality is the bolder you are in your faith, you will be attacked. If you are bold for Christ, and when I say not just saying Jesus is a neat guy, I mean you are talking that Jesus is the one and only way to salvation. If you are bold in that, people will not tolerate that in our culture. Because that's considered unacceptable. In fact, there are many church bodies that have caved in and decided, well, you could, believe, you could be an atheist and you could be saved. There are church bodies that have already caved into that idea. Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, they can all be saved according to some church bodies. But that doesn't go with scripture at all. There is only one name under which you are saved, and that is Christ. And if you proclaim that, you will be attacked. And that doesn't even take into, and not only that, life itself is difficult. I mean, think about it. A year ago, we were not worshiping here. We were still online a year ago. So, and difficulties, tribulations have not disappeared. Life still brings many difficulties. And so this verse is saying, that as we walk through this journey, as we are carrying out the mission, the devil finds all these ways to attack, to distract our attention. And life will beat you down. And so it says, the flesh that for our world. So Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the flesh who for our world was wounded. And so... He int the living for the wounded plead. So in other words, he is there interceding for you as you are wounded by the world. The one who is wounded for the world intercedes for you as you are wounded by the world. Verse 3. To our lives of wanton wandering, 
Send your spirit, promise guide, through our lives of fear and failure, with your power and love abide. We are like, throughout the scripture, we are compared to what animal? Sheep. What do sheep like to do? Wander. And so all throughout our lives, we are constantly wandering and paying attention to anything and everything else other than Christ. And so this, that verse, is a, it's a prayer that the Holy Spirit would guide us to basically keep drawing us back again and again. And if you're wondering, how does he do that? How does God give, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? And by the way, you don't feel the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I really felt the Spirit today. No, you didn't. The Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. There, is other, there are religions that are not called Christianity that believe you could feel the Holy Spirit. It's like, that's actually a heresy. The church fought it for many centuries. You don't feel the Holy Spirit. The devil wants you to believe you do, because then when you are not in a good mood and you come to church, and by the way, I was actually, before I became a pastor, I was convinced you had to feel it. Until I remember coming to church one day, and I was just in a really groggy mood, and I just did not feel the Holy Spirit, and I thought I was no longer saved. The devil wants you to think like that. The Holy Spirit, you don't feel him. The Holy Spirit comes to you in the way that Scripture tells you. Through his word, through his sacrament. That's why you come to this place. And I don't mean specifically St. Paul Lutheran Church. This is why you come to the service. To receive his word, to receive his sacrament, because the devil is constantly trying to drag you away. He is constantly lead, trying to lead you away so that way he can devour you. As Luther put it, if you knew how many flaming darts the devil was firing at you, you would have run to the sacrament as often as you could. Because see, the devil knows he can't defeat God. But he knows he can destroy the ones he loves. You. And that's why he works non-stop. And that's why you need the word. Your sa the sacrament, non-stop. That's how you receive the Spirit. If you are hearing the Word, you are receiving the Spirit, even if you don't feel it. That's why even if you sit there and pray, have you ever had those days when you've sat to read the Bible and it's really hard to read it because you're just groggy? You're still receiving the Holy Spirit whether you feel it or not. Don't put it, because you're putting God's work on you rather than Him. And whenever you put anything on yourself, you get in trouble. And then it says here, Welcome us as you were welcomed. Do you remember how I just talked about how Jesus was welcomed? The great host of heaven. So this hymn, for me, has a personal connection. Because a few years ago, this is when I was still in Ocheedon, Right around Ascension Day, my uncle, who was extremely supportive of me through seminary, had died. And so what I decided to do was sing this hymn for his funeral. And the reason is, is because the, when we get to this last part, it's now talking about what we are looking forward to. When a person dies, they say the last thing that goes is your what? Hearing. So imagine the first thing that you hear on the other side is the angels welcoming you as Jesus was welcomed. The song that you will hear that no mortal ear has ever heard. Music beyond your imagination. And by the way, they are not singing because you're so awesome. They are singing because Jesus is so awesome 
And Jesus is basically bra- going to be standing there bragging like, you have no idea how hard it was to get that person in here. Because God, you don't get in on anything you did. It's purely by the grace and mercy of our God. In fact, to give you ideas of how extravagant this is, this year I gave an assignment to our seventh graders, and the person who I'm going to mention got, hopefully they don't get embarrassed, um, but our seventh graders, they had to do a book report, and one of them did Jonah, and the very end question, I thought it was a good question, was why does Jonah not, why does Jonah struggle with God's mercy? to the Ninevites, which is actually a good question. Because if you don't know the, back, the background, it seems very petty. When you bring in the historical background, you begin to realize why. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians, historically, were one of the most brutal groups of people in the history of the world. I had actually thought about sending a link, try to find a good article on their brutality. I found one that went into detail and I didn't send the link because I thought it would give nightmares and it might make someone sick. Because I was getting sick to the stomach reading the things that they were doing to people. So Jonah, the Assyrians were the people that people in Jonah's day would have nightmares about. And so, and to actually could make things worse, so Jonah is from the northern kingdom. Do you know what happened to the northern kingdom a few decades after Jonah had died? It was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. So in other words, the children or grandchildren of the very people that God had mercy on. So you could, part of you is like, ah, he, he seems validated. But see, that's the thing about God's grace and mercy. It is so wonderful when you realize that's going to apply to me. But when you realize that it also can apply to the worst of people, it's harder to deal with. But it's also comforting to know that you can never be so far gone that the grace of Jesus cannot cover you. You can never sin so much that God will no longer forgive you. And that's what you get in the Ninevites. He will, and you, no matter how great a sinner you were in this life, if you die confessing Christ as Lord, you will be welcomed as Christ was welcomed to an endless Easter tide. And so as a person dies, their senses go and they enter into heaven, the first sense that comes back is that hearing of the angels. And then it says here in verse 4, Alleluia, Alleluia, O oh, to breathe the Spirit's grace. So they'll cease to breathe the breath of this world, and they'll breathe the breath of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, Alleluia, O oh, to see the Father's face. Do you realize how extravagant of a thought that is? In this world, you could not bear to see God. Because he is so holy, you cannot look upon him. I remember seeing a joke where it said there's a song, there's a church that kept on begging that God would show them his glory. And in the end, they, he showed them their glory and the whole church was dead because they couldn't bear it. So you don't want to see God's glory when you are a sinner because you can't, you you can't handle it. In fact... You are so far from it. You know Moses, that great prophet? When he was, able, he was allowed to see God the Father, do you know what part of God the Father he got to see? It was his backside. Which for you in modern, in 21st century America, there's a term we call this. Mooning. God mooned Moses. Because that was the only part of God that Moses was worthy to look at. And you are not even worthy of that. And yet, when you leave this place, when I mean when you die, when you pass from this world, 
you will look upon the smiling face of your heavenly Father. And then, alleluia, alleluia. Oh, to feel the, fa- the Son's embrace. You will feel Jesus hugging you, embracing you, welcoming you to his kingdom. See, Ascension Day, it is all about Christ who is the victorious king over sin, death, and the devil. It is about the mission of the church, the reason you are still here. And it is about the hope we are waiting for. When we will hear those angels, when we'll breathe the breath of the Spirit, when we will see the Father's face, when we will be embraced and welcomed home by Jesus himself. That is what we are looking to. But we are here fighting, serving, being witnesses of his mercy and grace to Jerusalem. Where is Jerusalem for you? Ida Grove, Odebolt, Battle Creek, Arthur, wherever. Where is your Judea? Just think west, west of I-35 to Nebraska border. We'll go there. Where is your Samaria? Nebraska, South Dakota, Minnesota, Kansas. Your ends of the earth? I don't think I have to explain that. And by the way, that's why it was so great that our Ascension Day is at Mission Central, because guess what they are doing at Mission Central? Going to the ends of the earth. And you are the missionaries here to be witnesses in your Jerusalem, your Judea, wherever your life may be, so that you may join together to breathe the Spirit's grace, see the Father's face, feel the embrace of Jesus, and hear that endless Easter tide. Till that day comes, to him be all glory. Amen. The grace, peace, and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Amen.